Good morning, everybody. Happy All Saints Day to our Catholic friends watching on the YouTubes. Happy All Saints Day. It's also uh, Dia de los Muertos, right? Day of the Dead if you're in Mexico. Um, A day for remembrance. So uh, for those who have gone before. Um, I hope everyone is well today. Uh, First day of November in however long we've been in this pandemic, Lorna knows, how many weeks has this been now? Week 34! Yay! Yay. (laughs) Remember, there's only 52 weeks in a year, so um, this too shall pass. Okay, so last week we had uh, the great privilege of guest speaker who I thought was interesting, who spoke on the Good Samaritan, the passage that we had just taught the, the Sunday before. So, uh, love your neighbor, um, love your enemy. Jesus has done a lot of teaching here about who we are to love, and that's the overall theme of this: is love for one another is the whole unit section. And here we begin the third uh, quarter today, and the overall message for the next uh, set of lessons is godly love among believers. Um, We didn't cover last week's text, and we're not going to do that today, except I will read it to you. Uh, It was in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, actually it's 13, sorry, tablet's in the wrong spot. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, familiarly known as the love chapter. Um, That doesn't fit a tune. It's like the love chapter. No, it doesn't work. So anyway, uh, you don't want me to sing anyway. But I will read it to you. This is from the English Standard Version. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So, now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but... The greatest of these is love. Really familiar passage. You know, the greatest of all these things is love. And prior to this, Paul had been talking about the spiritual gifts. But he said, you can have all that great stuff, but if you're not using love as a verb, right, to carry it out, it's not doing you or anybody else any good. So abide in these. Love never ends, even though everything else will. Whether you act like a child and think like a child, now that you're a grown up, those things are now past. Even that is gone. But love still remains. So I want you to think about this in terms of the text that we're going to go into today, which is in John chapter 13. Uh, It is an event in history we call the Last Supper Um, it's actually the Passover feast, the last one that Jesus will observe with his disciples. So before we start that, let us pray. 
Our Father, we thank you, O Lord, for this day and this opportunity to be here in your house among the fellowship of the believers. We invite your Holy Spirit to be here with us today to teach us from your word. We just ask, O God, that you would open our minds to understand the scriptures, that the truth of your word would wash over us, that move us, and that we be doers of the word and not just hearers. We thank you, O Lord, for your great mercy through Jesus our Savior. Amen. Okay, John chapter 13. Let's see. Um, it's of the Last Supper, the Passover feast. It is out of this that we derive our, uh, what are we called, the sacrament, I guess, is what we're looking for. We call the Lord's Supper. And there are actually four other accounts of this in the Bible. Each of the synoptic gospels carries it. Uh, if you wish, you can flip back to Matthew chapter 26. It's in there. It's in Mark chapter 14. It's also Luke chapter 22. And interestingly enough, the oldest one of these texts is actually 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul says that the Lord himself revealed it to him on what happened on this particular night. Those texts all focus primarily on the elements, right? The cup and the bread. That's, that's what they are, the central to, to their message. John, on the other hand, his focus here for the next several chapters, uh, starting in 13, is really on the final teachings of Jesus. He hardly even mentions uh, the feast or the cup itself. He's focused on what Jesus is doing right up until he's arrested. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing in uh, how he has done this. John sees a different view of this than the others. So we're going to go right on into it. Okay, here we go. So at verse 1, I guess I should get my Bible out here. Here we go, verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Okay, right before the Passover festival. So we are going to go have a little review in the book of Exodus. Um, Passover, what is it? What comes to your mind immediately, but what is the Passover? The angel of death? I dispute that. Blood on the doors. Yeah, and why? What? To protect the people from a plague, I think. To protect the people from a plague. Yep, okay, we're going to look at, just for review, since we're in the New Testament, we're going to go back to an ancient tradition. We're going to read about it, Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 7. This is the Lord speaking. It says, Then they shall take some of the blood, that's of the lamb, the perfect spotless lamb, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So Jesus and the disciples are obeying this statute of God that he has established thousands of years before at the Exodus. They observe this every year by decree of the Lord himself. 
To your point about the angel of death, there is no reference anywhere in Exodus to the angel of death. God himself executes the judgment. Um, I think that we get that concept from a particular film, right? Um, Cecil B. DeMille was a great director, but I don't think he read the Bible. So anyway, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike the firstborn. I am the Lord. God himself, the only righteous judge, is the one capable of carrying out this judgment on Egypt. And it is the plague, the plague of the death of the firstborn. And those who had the blood on their posts and on lintel, they were passed over by God. So, in this respect, blood has saved them. Jesus here in this position, on this night of the Passover, is going to be our Passover lamb. That's a whole other Sunday school lesson. So anyway, there's your review on Passover. We'll get to the second half of this verse, right? Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Okay, his time had come. The text of your, your lesson here notes that this is a, actually a turning point in the book of John. And I'll show you how, right? So if you flip back to John chapter 2... At verse 4, this is a wedding in Cana. Um, there's a, it says the wine ran out at this wedding, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, comes up to him and says they have no wine. Verse 4, and Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But he's a good boy anyway, and he turns the water into wine, because his mom asks. So, but more importantly is this, my hour has not yet come. In John chapter 7, at verse 30, during the Feast of the Tabernacles, we see another occurrence, right? It's like he has been dialoguing with the Jews at the temple. And he says, so they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. John will point this out in the very next chapter when he is arguing again with the Pharisees, and this is right after he has claimed that God is his Father, right? So he equates him with the Father in heaven, which they did not approve of, but he says this, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught it in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. All throughout Jesus' ministry, in spite of the opposition that was there, people who wanted to make him go away. They could not because God protected him the whole time. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. He was not, this was not his purpose in his time at those, right? He was there to teach, you know, show the very essence of God to the people, but his fulfillment was not yet there. But now, just days before this, John chapter 12 at verse 27 this is just, literally just before the Passover feast. This is John 12 at 27, right? He says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so he's reached that point, the purpose for which he has come, to sacrifice himself to save the human race from sin, right? So that we can once be back in fellowship with God. So that's why he's here. This hour has now come here at the Last Supper. He knows it's all fulfilled, and he knows that he's going back to the Father, where he came from. And I like the way it says here, he says, having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. He loved them completely or perfectly is, is how this would actually be rendered in a literal sense. He, his soul is troubled, but right up to the very end, he is still caring for these 12 men that he's chosen. He's meeting their needs when he knows that in just a, a handful of hours, 
death is waiting for him on the cross. The humiliation of the cross is coming, and yet here at the very end, he's still loving these men that he's chosen. So, completely and perfectly, as only the Savior is able to do. Well, that was the first verse, so we're doing good. Thoughts up to this point? Okay, so you're all still with me. Good. Verse 2. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. All right. Luke fills in some important details for us here, and we're going to go take a look at that. This is Luke chapter 22 of what is going on, right? He says, the meal's already being served. We'll get that in just a second. The devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon, to betray Jesus, right? So we have Judas, Judah ben Shimon of Kiriot, right, is what his name means. He has a little conspiracy going on. So in Luke chapter 22, verse 1, says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money, So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. So we've got to do this inconspicuously because Jesus is actually very popular with the people uh, at this point. I mean, you can just look back just a couple verses before. We've had the triumphal entry, right, when thousands of people in Jerusalem, right, and they're saying, you know, know, Hosanna, the son of David, right, here is our king, Very popular at this point. Judas is having a problem. Um, John notes in just the previous chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 6, he notes that Judas is actually a thief. Um, Just helped himself to the money in their money bag during their ministry. So Judas has in his mind... I don't know what's gotten into him other than Satan, right? He's going to convince him to betray Jesus. And so they're sitting here waiting for this perfect moment. But, so that's the part of this this conspiracy that's going on here where he says, the devil had already prompted Judas. Now, the evening meal is already underway. So let's go to verses 3 through 5. Okay, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was turning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Hmm, Jesus is in control of the situation even though there's a conspiracy going on against him, Jesus is, there's, he's, nothing is happening that he's not aware of. Again, Luke gives us a glimpse into what's going on. This is in verse 17. He says, and this is the familiar part that you'll know, he says, And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which one of them it could be who was going to do this. So, and here's the verse I really find interesting about this passage. Verse 24, A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. So, three points to note from John and from Luke. 
The meal has already started. John points that out. Luke you know, points out here the, the cup and uh, the bread are being served. Meal's already underway. Two, Jesus announces he is going to be betrayed. And they all began to wonder, all of them, who is it? Right? It's kind of interesting. These followers of Jesus, now he's like, and they're all questioning, who, who's the betrayer? Could it be me? No, oh, surely not me. But anyway, and the third point, a dispute also rose among them as to which them was to be regarded as the greatest. They're arguing with each other. And this is actually not the first time that it, this has happened. If you flip back in both in Luke and in Mark, you see that there are times when they're, they're arguing with each other while walking down a road. Who is the greatest? Might be a little pride problem among, them, among these men. So, I'm going to pause right there and ask a question. Has anyone here ever eaten at Alibaba's restaurant down in Newark? It's kind of down there by the university in along Main Street. Anybody at Alibaba's Newark? You've eaten in Alibaba's. How'd you like the food? It's good. Really good. Their lentil soup is two thumbs up. <laughs> so my, my work group went there well, it's been a couple of years now. We went there for lunch. And when, when we ate there, I suddenly understood this passage. Because you go into Alibaba's and eat, you're not sitting in, you know, at proper, you know, Western type ta with tables and chairs and then all that sort of stuff. You're actually sitting, the, the, the tables are like low, right? You're close to, very close to the floor. And instead of chairs, you're sitting on cushions, right? So it actually kind of makes it hard to sit up so you're actually kind of reclining when, you, when, you, when you're there. And so where it's noted here in Luke, right, it says they are reclining at the table, right? This is verse, Luke 20, 14. He reclined at table and the apostles with him, right? So they're eating, they're down close to the floor, and they're just kind of in this sort of this U-shaped table there. It's, it's nothing like Leonardo's painting of the Last Supper, right? They're not at a big, long, fancy table. They're, that's just not that way. Okay. So when you're sitting down there that close to the floor, kind of reclining, it is sort of inevitable that your neighbor's feet are sort of close to your face, right? So that's just kind of what happens. So the next question I have for the audience is, who in here, and I raise your hands, who you farm for a living, right? You either work the soil or you raise animals. Anybody? Get your hands up. Don't just do this. Okay. I don't know if camera guy can see that or not, but anyway, we have a few hands up. Question for you men. When you're out there working with your animals or in the dirt or the mud or whatever you're doing, when it's time to come in and eat, does your wife just let you walk in, cross the carpet, into the kitchen? Do they? Glenn says no. <laughs> so you have filthy boots on, right? Especially if you've been out among animals, right? Say you're cleaning a barn or a stable. What do you do with your boots or shoes or whatever you've got on? You leave them outside, right? Or in your garage or wherever you're going, because Eileen's never going to let you in the house that way, right? Smart move. Well, those of you who farm or ranch, suppose you had to do that job wearing sandals, right? You're wearing Birkenstocks, but you're not hippies, obviously. But anyway, but that's what you're wearing. What would your feet look like at the end of the day? At least with a boot, you can kick that thing off. What do your feet look like exposed to the grime? It's a little unpleasant, right? Okay. The feet need to be washed. Normally, in a house, if you're coming to somebody's house for a meal or anybody, it's like, 
Outside, there's a big pot of water to wash your feet before you come in, right? Before you go in, your feet need to be washed. Well, that didn't happen here, right? They have already enjoined the meal with dirty feet reclining with those stinky feet right up next to their neighbor's face. That is not the way to love your neighbor. So, no wonder I can't see. <laughs> okay. Now I have to credit my former pastor in Oregon for this. Feet are like opinions. Everybody has them. Most of them stink. So, <laughs> thanks, Pastor Don. <laughs> Amazing what you can remember after so many years, right? Anyway, usually a slave is the one who is supposed to wash the feet. It is considered a, the most menial task of all, right? So it's actually interesting in the very beginning of the book of John when you see John the baptizer seeing Jesus, and he says, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals, right? You know, he's like, he's way up here, and I'm worse than the lowliest slave compared to him. I'm not even worthy to mess with his feet. Here are these men eating, dirty feet. They're arguing who is the greatest. That's an interesting scenario. Who's the greatest? But Jesus, he's being in very control of the situation. Jesus. Hmm. Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient and washed their feet. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist, thus assuming the dress of the lowliest slave. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. The Lord himself humbled himself to wash the feet of these twelve proud men, too good to have taken the time to wash their feet before they began to eat the Lord's Passover meal. Interesting scenario. So he does this. What do you bet that their argument stopped right then? What do you think? How would you react? You're arguing, and all of a sudden the Lord stands up and does this thing that the slave's supposed to do. I think you probably could have heard a pin drop. All right, verses 6 through 8. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Peter is in disbelief, right? My personal opinion doesn't say this. My personal opinion is Jesus gets to Peter last. He's been watching this for like 30 minutes now, right? There's 11 guys in front of him all getting their feet washed, right? So let's say it takes three minutes per person. He's been here watching us for like a half an hour in dead silence. You know, the, the leader of the disciples. Maybe he's one of the ones saying, who's, I'm the greatest, right? I, I mean, gee whiz. James and John, yeah. No, me, maybe. This is just me purely speculating. He's watching in silence. You will never wash my feet. This is, he's using the strongest negative there is in the Greek language, meaning you shall never, ever, no way, no how, wash my feet. It's just not going to happen. Interesting thing. Susan, <laughs> I will give him this bit of credit in this, that in Peter's mind, that 
the master of the house, in this case, his master, washing his feet, that just, he just dishonors the master, right? That's just, you know, no, that, that's just outrageous behavior. He's not going to dishonor the Lord by allowing this to happen. This is what's in his mind. On the other hand, here he is ordering his master what he can or can't do, right? You are not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, oh, yes, I am. And, but he puts it a little bit differently. He says, you know, I'm going to give you a little teaching moment here, Peter, right? He says, look, he says, you will understand this someday. And in fact, if you flipped over to 1 Peter 5.5, 5, you would see him make a reference. He says, clothe yourself in humility as you serve one another, right? He does get it later on. At the moment, he's sort of fixated on this physical act of washing. But he takes this and he says, okay, in the second half, Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. That literally means you have no inheritance with me, right? If I don't wash you. So I think that Jesus is, is taking this physical act that we're seeing and a spiritual truth is being illustrated from it. He says, I must wash you. I must cleanse you or you will not have your inheritance with me. So this washing, this cleansing has been understood for generations, right? King David, writing in Psalm 51, the great psalm of repentance, right, has language like this, right? He says in verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, right? Verse 7, he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. I have a hyssop plant growing in my garden. It smells like licorice. It's really quite lovely, um, not right now, it's dead. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, right? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Why, right? Because he says, cast me not away from your presence, right? I want to be in the presence of the Lord, but to do that, I must be clean, right? I must be clean. In Titus chapter 3, Come on. Titus chapter 3, verse 4, Paul writes, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We gain our inheritance with Him by being washed by Him. A little lesson for Peter right here. I must wash you, not just your feet, but I need to wash the inner self. So he, <laughs> Peter then, still focused on this physical act, Swings clearly to their direction. He says, well, all right then. Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Okay, well, <laughs> Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. So, before this meal, they all would have bathed that morning, right? But in walking to the destination, right, the dust of the road is going to get up, you know, on their feet through their sandals, and it needs to be washed before they eat. They need to be clean before going in. So Peter's still stuck in this idea of the physical cleaning himself. But then Jesus, then he goes, well, you're already clean in that respect. But not every one of you is. Again, it's like my pure speculation. I'm guessing he just threw a glance at Judas, son of Simon, from Curiot. Not all of you are clean. So, verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. 
Do you understand what I have done for you? Do you understand what he just did? Ooh. Hey, I like that synthetic voice. <laughs> Back in the book of Mark, my tab just went away. Mark chapter 9, at verse 33. This is one of the times when they're arguing. And they came to, C- to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and a servant of all. Jesus has carried out a living parable here by washing their feet. That's what he's done for them. Back to Luke 22, starting at verse 25. This is right after their argument. He says, and he said to them, so back up one verse, a dispute arose, who is the greatest? And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise the lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, or the least, and the leader as one who serves For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? Because the servants don't sit there. But I am among you as the one who serves. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you as my Father assigned to me a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel, You have an inheritance with me in the future. But I have come, and I am here your leader, your master, but I have served you in the washing of your feet. He loved them to the end perfectly. We're going to conclude this since we have two minutes left. Verse 34, Jesus said, oops, that's the wrong book. 34, back to the paper Bible. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He's giving them a new charge, right? He's changing the focus of this. He goes, I need you to raise the bar on love. And you need to love the way that I do, the way I have loved you. I've been with you from the very beginning. I'm with you to the very end. You need to love like me, right? The verb love, right? To do good to others, to look out for each other, to provide for your needs, to do those things, to honor your Father in heaven. And it's how the world may know that you belong to me. So in our present day and age, the command is still true. The world around us will know that we are disciples of Christ by the way we love each other, the way that we serve. It has nothing to do, so you may want to post it on your social media, whatever that be, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Mastodon or Insta, whatever you want to do, you can proclaim it, but the people need to see it, right? That we love each other, and we love our neighbors, and we love our enemies, as we were previously taught. That is how the world may know that you are a follower of Christ. Thoughts, comments? The Passover feast, becoming the Last Supper, becoming the Lord's Supper, and Jesus our Passover lamb. Loving perfectly to the end. All right. Go in peace, everyone. We'll see you next week.